have been a lot of incredible, unbelievable, shocking stories in football history. Stories that each deserve their own individual episode to truly dive into the depths of how that person or team created something magical. These stories are usually filled with pain, anguish, devastation, but then are followed by triumph, success, and most importantly, happiness. The story of Darren Waller matches each of these sentiments to a T and is one of the greatest, most inspiring redemption stories in recent memory. But unfortunately, like all redemption stories, it too begins with pain. From a young age, Waller was always extremely gifted, but in high school he struggled to fit in and feel comfortable, and due to his constant anxiety and depression, he started popping prescription pills and later tried just about anything he could get his hands on. He got a scholarship to Georgia Tech as a wide receiver, and while he never truly broke out there, in his third season he got six touchdowns on just 26 receptions, and despite partying harder than ever, and even using before games, he declared for the 2015 NFL Draft. When John Harbaugh realized he was still available all the way in the sixth round, he was absolutely stunned. He had graded Waller as one of the four best receivers in the entire class, but then he heard whispers of character concerns, which is putting it mildly. Still, the Ravens drafted Waller in the sixth round, 204th overall, but the pressure of moving on to the NFL made Waller's drug usage become more and more rampant. As he headed to training camp, he said he was the last one into the building and the first one out, so he could get home ASAP and get as high as possible. He hated the pressure of playing football so much, he self-destructed and tried to fail as many drug tests as he could, knowing the NFL would kick him out of the league. In 2016, he was suspended the first four games of the season for failing a test, and then in 2017, he was suspended an entire year, and that's when Waller hit rock bottom. One day during his suspension, he went to buy pills from his dealer, but they were actually laced with fentanyl. It could have killed him. That was the moment everything changed. Waller realized something was seriously wrong, so he went to rehab where he dramatically improved and reignited his passion for doing things he loved, like football. After a brief stint bagging groceries at Sprouts, the NFL reinstated him in 2018 and he landed on the Ravens practice squad, but then when the Raiders saw him warming up before a game, they signed him for peanuts as a tight end. He barely played in 2018, but then in 2019, he broke out with 90 catches, 1145 yards and three touchdowns, which brings us to last year when he broke out all over again. 107 catches, 1196 yards, and 9 touchdowns. Waller has been clean and sober ever since his near-death experience. He improved his mental health to finally match his superhuman physical ability. So how have John Gruden and the Raiders maximized his physical and mental prowess to make him one of the best, not just tight ends, but weapons in the league? Gruden has long coveted the Joker position in his offense, which he says is a guy you can line up in any hand, a player who can be used in any position, in any formation, who makes big plays at any moment. Waller has become Gruden's Joker. Last year, the Raiders targeted him 28% of the time, which was less than only Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, and New Hopkins. But Waller plays primarily in line, meaning he's attached to the formation as a tight end, while also playing out wide and in the slot about 40% of the time. He's mostly a receiver, but his ability to run block and pass protect, sometimes against the NFL's greatest pass rushers, opens up a lot of the things he can do through the air. The Raiders will even slide protection away from him, and although he's usually getting help from the running back, he can take care of guys like Cam Jordan all by himself. Not only do his pass protection skills just help keeping Derek Carr clean, but bleed into how Gruden can more effectively deploy him in the passing game. The Saints got tired of wasting defenders when Waller was blocking Jordan, so they started green-dogging their safety Malcolm Jenkins, meaning if he sees Waller blocking, he'll blitz, and if not, he'll cover him like normal. Waller is very cerebral and is well aware of this, so he starts at Jordan for a step to trigger Jenkins into green-dogging, which gets him to charge forward into no man's land, forcing him into a power game instead of a speed game, and he has no shot in hell to win that. Waller uses basically a pass rusher move, a club swim to disengage him, and picks up some serious yak. He averaged 7.4 yards after the catch, which was the most of any tight end. And just like that Saints example, Gruden creates major yak opportunities for him by dialing up the weak side choice concept, which gives Waller the option to go in or out based on how he reads the defender. 
and Gruden loves lining him up off the line of scrimmage to give him a free release to pick up speed without getting bumped. Since defenses typically push coverage to the offense's strength, the side with more receivers, that greatly increases the odds that Waller is going to be matched one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker on the weak side. Gruden likes using this tight split where the two tight ends are real close together, and we'll see it again in a sec, because here it heavily affects Harvey Lungy, who has to bust his ass outside in case Waller's using Foster Moreau as a shield, which then allows Waller to explode back inside and create even more separation and yardage. Because Gruden knows he's extremely versatile and can excel in multiple roles as a receiver, he calls on him to execute many different concepts at a very high level. Typically, that choice route is paired with a corner, kind of as a clear out, and with a similar tight split like the previous play, the arches concept is a nice changeup. The first receiver runs a shallow cross, which isn't in the quarterback's progression, it's really just a clear space for arches, and it's really tough if an inside defender needs to fight over the top of the shallow, or if an outside defender is covering arches from outside leverage. But when the Chiefs drop into zone, Waller is smart enough to sit down a bit and then pick up more yards after the catch like the yak god that he is. The Raiders run arches probably more than anybody else in the league, so every now and then when defenses have seen it over and over during a game, Waller, unlike almost any other tight end, is able to run vertical style routes and show off his insane 446 speed. Here they are running Arches Stream, which is designed to look like Arches where Waller fakes that route, then runs the double move. You can see Dan Sorensen sitting heavy inside anticipating Arches, so Waller just burns right past him for an explosive play. But in true Joker fashion, he doesn't just run routes off the line of scrimmage and tight to the formation. He can be flexed outside as a true X receiver on the ball and use his unique blend of power and speed to torch just about anybody you put in front of him. Within a game, defenses will cycle through every one of their corners and safeties trying to guard him, since nobody actually can. So after he smashes somebody, they trot out the next guy. Waller doesn't have a lot of moves in his arsenal to beat press at the line. He doesn't really need to. He likes to use a foot fire release where he gives a couple of quick steps to freeze Eric Rowe in place, then uses his quick twitch to get outside of his frame. The key part of this release is Waller using his 33 and a quarter inch arms to create separation. Rowe is trying to use a catch technique to slow his progress off the line, but Waller uses his reach to evade that technique, while also using Rowe to propel himself forward. Tight ends don't get much work outside like this, but since Waller used to play receiver, he knows the importance of establishing the red line, which is about 5 yards from the sideline, in order to give Carr more room to throw outside in case he has to adjust. When Waller is lined up as this isolated X receiver, he's able to convert his routes and adjust to whatever kind of technique the defender is using on a given play. Based on where the defender is aligned pre or post snap, Waller will run a different route to defeat them. In West Coast terminology, this is called a thunder route, which is a 6 yard hitch against off coverage, but converts to a fade against press or tight man at the line. When Michael Davis kinda uses a ghost technique to flash like he's gonna put his hands on Waller, he again uses that club swim move, and even though it's a tight end facing a cornerback, Waller is just faster. When the Chargers put Chris Harris on him and say, we're not gonna press him with a corner after that, Waller can convert the Thunder route into that six yard hitch when he sees Harris is off and picks up extra yards for the first down. Inline tight end, flex tight end, slot receiver, X receiver, he can really do it all, but a true Gruden Joker can line up at other positions too, and of course execute his favorite concept, Spider 2 Y Banana. It's a concept we all know and love, it's even on t-shirts for the real ones, and it's a call Gruden dials up almost exclusively on third or fourth and short, so let's break down exactly what the play call means. It's a play action pass where Spider is slide protection, the S and P in Spider is for slide protection, and 2 tells the line which way to slide. Even numbers go to the left, odd to the right. So since QBs are almost always right-handed, that's probably why Spider 3Y Banana isn't nearly as popular. Y Banana refers to the tight end's corner route since it looks like a banana, kinda, I guess? And the reason the play is so effective goes back to earlier in the episode where we saw how Waller's blocking ability affects the passing game. Waller fakes like he's gonna block the end Cam Jordan to make it look like a run, but then he shoots to the flat, Josh Jacobs cuts Jordan to clean up that side of the protection, and Waller picks up an easy completion to convert the first down. Then later, the Raiders run it again, except they know since Waller's on fire, he'll draw eyes, so they motion him out and run the same exact play throwing to the fullback Alec Ingold for a touchdown. 
And after they put all that on tape in Week 2, later in the season against the Chiefs in Week 11, they dial up the same core concept, but with a modern twist, where they jet motion Henry Ruggs across so he acts as the fullback to the flat, but trick the Chiefs by pulling Waller across the formation instead of running the banana, and he's as wide open as the schedule of whoever cuts Mark Davis's hair. Versatility is really the word I'd use to describe Waller's entire game, and why he's so valuable to Gruden and Derek Carr in this offense. But versatile is also how he can be described as a person based on what he's been through and how he's completely changed course and revitalized his career. His story isn't just about football and the incredible talent he proudly displays every Sunday, but how he fell all the way down to the very bottom and slowly built himself up to where he is now as a person. He struggled with confidence, anxiety, and depression like many of us, including myself, but through that brutal work and hardship, he found peace with who he really is. The best sports stories aren't guys whose careers go up in flames, but people who have experienced real adversity and provide lessons with a path for everybody. There is no doubt the tenacity Waller learned throughout his long, arduous journey has helped him explode on the field, and now he's one of the best players in the entire league. He has been completely transparent about what happened, and his success story provides hope for many who are struggling. Now that he's become his best self, he wrecks dudes every single week on the field. Sports can teach us lessons about life, and Darren Waller has inspired countless people. Now the story he tells when he's on and off the field, just win, baby. Thank you so much to everybody for watching this week's episode. I am really excited to say that this is our 100th episode, which is absolutely crazy. I started this channel at the beginning of 2019, not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life after graduating college. And the responses from all of you, and especially the people who support me on Patreon, makes me feel really lucky to be doing something I love each and every week. I couldn't do this without all of you. Talking and connecting with you guys who I see every single week in the comment section, community tab, all of you who support the work I'm doing, it means more than you'll ever know and really makes me happy we get to share all of this together. We'll be going strong with a new episode every Saturday throughout the season and beyond, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has and continues to keep rocking with me. The season is coming. Please drop some recommendations in the comment section for future episode topics, and I can't wait to see how this channel and our community continues to grow. All right, everybody, thank you so much. I just wanted to say that again, and I'll see you next Saturday. Bye.